I wanted to do industrial research because I wanted to do more translational research. And that was always a driving force. I mean, during my PhD also majorly my focus was in cancers, but mostly human data, right? And by the end of the PhD, I realized that the market of bioinformatics was actually growing up in the industry side as well. I wanted to explore that and more in the translational setting, something more in between. And the, this was always there in my mind. Welcome to the PhD Talk Show by Biopatrika. I'm Charu Gupta, your host for today's session with Dr. Vivek Das, Senior Research Scientist at Novo Nordisk, Denmark. Welcome, Vivek. Thank you. Thanks for the invite. Thanks. So let's begin with an insight into your academic journey. You did your master's in India, PhD from Italy, and then you moved for a postdoc to USA and are now back in Denmark. So what was the one major force that drove you towards picking up these challenges? Well, I, I'm a very curious person, so and I, I try to always uh, do something that is uncomfortable that challenges me, and that's that's what the driving force for me to take up different challenges. And I, additionally, I, I love to travel, so kind of mixed both, and that's what we took <laughs> took me around the world so far. Right. So USA is a little bit of a difficult market right now for Indians because of immigration issues. Um, and I noted, uh, and several folks are now looking towards other countries. So would you recommend your PhD school, the European School of Molecular Biology? What was the admission process like? Yeah, sure. I mean, actually, I mean, there's a story. Like I, I was applying for, uh, you know, PhD back in the days in US, but my GRE scores were not that great enough at the time to offer me a full-time scholarship. And it was one of my friend who was actually doing his PhD in, in uh, Europe suggested me to look up European schools. And that's where I learned there's a huge market out there. It's just not very openly out there for people to know. So I would definitely suggest uh, to look at the European schools. Our, the school where I did my PhD as well, they have annual you know, entrance exams and they, have a, they kind of recruit almost 20 to 25 people every year for a PhD in different programs. So definitely I would recommend people to look outside of the US as well. And, explore around in the European side. So how did you come across this uh, PhD program that you then committed to? It is a bit of a long answer, but I'll, I'll try to be as precise as possible. So after my master's, I, I wanted to be a, a kind of, I wanted to go for a PhD or I did my master's in mathematics from India and have a research uh, kind of, um, uh, so my master's was researched by profession, uh, like it was, it had to have an, a, a thesis uh, research. So I did six months uh, research there. And then I wanted to kind of be into PhD. However, in India, it's very difficult to qualify a PhD. So back, back then, I, I was planning to prepare for both that plus the, uh, the US PhD. And by, by once I finished my uh, kind of uh, exam, I realized that I, I won't get anything a big scholarship. So I started uh, a job. I got. I was fortunate enough to get a job in the IT industry because of my programming background in mathematics. And then since then, as I, I kind of started scanning around the, the like the possibilities of PhD outside of US. And some of my friends actually kind of guided me around like where I should look uh, and where are the different possibilities in Europe. And and that's how I kind of you know I used to work in the day, <laughs> during the day and in, in the night I used to kind of look around what are the different schools available in Europe and what is the admission process and how to reach out to different kind of you know PIs and and, and it was a learning process for six to nine months. Um, then I kind of one year into the job I started aggressively pursuing it. Uh, after numerous rejections, finally I landed up one <laughs> one position one well, two positions actually back in the days. So this is this was a this was a kind of a journey that took me two years almost, but uh, it was a huge learning process. But it was also a way where I was kind of working and kind of adjusting the way to make my uh, you know make through the PhD process at that time to get an admission to a PhD program. So you you seem to have had quite a bit of experience juggling industry and academia, and then you were obviously a student, then you moved to your job, then you moved to your PhD, and now you're in, in industry again. So uh, what made you do these, uh, you know, finally commit to industry? And um, do you have any regrets about leaving the academics? No, I actually have no regrets. And that's a great question. But I actually don't have any regrets leaving academics. My current job allows me to actually work with uh, academic uh, leading academic institutes and, uh, you know, uh, labs. Uh, I, I oversee a lot of external consortia projects uh, where we are trying to, you know, 
you know, you know get get a, get a sense of how the data that is generated uh, with the academic collaboration can help us to facilitate the research in the industry setting in the early early research setting. I don't regret at all uh, moving out, but I was very persistent that I wanted to have first of all I wanted to do industrial research because I wanted to do more translational research. And that was always a driving force. I mean, during my PhD, also majorly my focus was in cancers, but mostly human data, right? And by the end of the PhD, I realized that the market of bioinformatics was actually growing up in the industry side as well. I wanted to explore that and more in the translational setting, something more in the clinical. This was always there in my mind, but I never had a clear path how it will work out. So I kind of started, you know, uh, planning uh, from from maybe mid mid through my PhD, like I would move to the industry path. But it, it took some time to do that route as well. So speaking of your job, you're a senior research scientist at Novo Nordisk and you work on um, biomarker discovery. So what does a typical day at work look like? Yeah, so I'll, I'll just correct a bit. So I am I work in the systems biology and target ID. Right. So there's a term called target ID, which means that what we do uh, is basically we scan through different public and private uh, human data sets that we generate across. Okay. And you know, use systems biology, computational biology, systems biology to find early candidate drug targets. Uh, and I work in the chronic kidney disease setting. And then, if some from there something qualifies as a progression biomarker, that's also something I do. But primarily, it's early candidate drug targets. My day-to-day -day life actually looks like I usually I have I, I have a few hours dedicated for analysis based on what we need to deliver on different kind of projects. Um, quite a lot of meetings in industry. You have quite a lot of meetings. Uh, and then status upsets, uh, updates around different other projects with uh, projects as well. I do mentor quite a few, you know, master students, uh, postdocs around the different collaborations that I, I have. Uh, so I, I have some dedicated hours for that. And having said that, if if I have some time, I also dedicate uh, not a lot, but like a few minutes or so in the day for reading as well. Uh, so this this is a typical day. Uh, can break it up most of the time. But yeah, major chunk uh, often ha also goes into meetings at times. Right. So um, what kind of transferable skills did your PhD give you um, to move into this role? So one of the transferable skills I have, I was fortunate enough where I worked in, in, uh, in the academy, I was working in human data. I was working in solid tissues, right? I was doing a lot of different types of omics analysis. So, and my job in the industry, the, as an industry postdoc, was basically to study chronic kidney disease. It's again a solid organ, and it, it is a very complex organ. Back in the days, I studied ovarian cancer and, and brain cancer, and brain is also a very, very complex organ. So, one of the things that I transferred from there was, of course, all the computational skills that I needed. I wanted to apply in a different uh, disease area. It was a that was kind of the kind of the transferable skills in terms of the type of technologies I've worked with, the uh, type of analysis I did. So this kind of motivated me the, um, that that's something I could transfer uh, at my end. And I have always worked in multiple different organs and solid tissues. So, so I was trying to figure out, can that also leverage me to actually learn something new? Because I had an idea of uh, how solid organs and organ physiology can be complex. So these are the few transferable skills. Um, and another thing was uh, I have I've had a lot of failures in my life and, and, you know, so it's all, all good. That's, that's another thing that kind of motivated me also, you know, what, what worse will happen? <laughs> I will, at some point of time, I will, I will, I will, you know, figure it out. So, so yeah, persistence, let's put it like that. Uh, persistence was another transfer with skills. It's, it's, it's so well said. I mean, PhD does prepare you for so many different things. And in your case, it looks like the PhD was sort of necessary. Um, to put you where you are today and to give you this job in the industry and make you comfortable in that setup. Uh, but what kind of advice would you give to someone who is contemplating doing a PhD? How do they decide whether it's important or not? Because it's not necessary that every job requires you to have a PhD. It's a huge commitment and a lot of effort that goes towards it. Absolutely. That's a great question. I mean, see, it all depends on what what is someone's, you know, uh, let's say goal or ambition, right? When I did my master's, I was very much hooked into bioinformatics, and uh, I and I realized that after my master's, I wanted to be in this field, but it's not that straightforward. Once I worked in the industry, I picked up a bit more programmatic skills, uh, but I still was kind of my goal was always to be in the bioinformatics uh, field, 
And my next step was a logical step was a PhD. After that, I wanted to go back to the industry, but still use my core uh, skills, right? So if one is having kind of a, a, an aim, uh, they should really, really be persistent and thorough about it. There will be challenges, but uh, if you're ambitious, if, if you're pursuant, then if you, if you, if you have a uh, kind of certain goals in mind, they, they should be able to do it. Another thing is find a mentor uh, in their life to who can actually also help them navigate and give the put them on track on in certain things. Uh, that is also very important. These are the few things that I that comes to my mind at this moment that I would suggest. So speaking of mentorship, have you had mentors during your journey, and what have they influenced you on? Yes. Um, my entire journey in the last decade is full of wonderful mentors that I've come across during my PhD, during my postdoc, and in my current job as well. And I have learned over the years that this is one of the most important thing that can actually help somebody to you know, succeed and progress in their career. Uh, my PhD mentor supervisor and the postdoc was, was one of the starting influence uh, how one should think where, where we can marry computational science with biology and uh, then my postdoc mentor who's still kind of a mentor here uh, in the current job as well was where where we can actually bring those skills now in a chronic disease setting where we don't have the luxury of data sets as we get in cancers but we can still kind of learn and still kind of make certain uh, you know insights out of the data which can still facilitate the early research process um, and 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 they have been very, very helpful for me over the years to, you know, uh, help me open my mind, uh, clear my blind spots, uh, challenge, they have challenged me, uh, which helped me improve and improvise, and let me challenge themselves as well. So, so this is, this is how my journey has been so far, and I have been, it, it's been fun. Uh, I, I really think that uh, if somebody's up for it, they should really try these kind of routes. Uh, given the given ambition and the, the kind of you know goals they set for themselves. So to challenge and be challenged, two sides of yeah. a coin. <laughs> so moving Absolutely. to another <laughs> sorry, moving to another two sides of a coin. You did a short postdoc in academia and you did a short uh, uh, not a short but uh, a decent amount of time committed to um an industry postdoc. So how are these two different or are they just similar and there's no difference at all? So the, my, my academic postdoc was brief, like six to seven months, because it was a wrap up after my PhD. And uh, it was it was mostly like wrapping up the project, handing over to some, uh, someone else before I, I, you know, finalized my move to US for my industry postdoc. Industry postdoc was, uh, was actually, so I'm not very aware of how an academic postdoc in an whole academic setting works like, because my stint was very small. Uh, but uh, my industry postdoc, what I would say was very project based. Uh, there were a few projects uh, I was where, where we had a clear goal of what, what our task was. Like, uh, like we had a clear goal. I had a clear goal that I need to help with target discovery, right? And what are the different uh, to do that? I was working with different consortia. There, where I was leading certain work packages and helping with analysis of certain work packages, and we need to figure out how well I can support that using my computational graphic skills. So this was my my goal. This was this was a goal that was very clear. And I am a person who actually likes clarity, so I will kind of pester my <laughs> collaborators if there's no clarity in what we do. And it's it's often it happens in in research that you often don't have that, that clarity. So I'm fortunate enough that you know that kind sort of certain clarity in terms of projects and the goals were very much there for me, and 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 they kind of you know helped me build my entire kind of industry postdoc uh, and deliverables and, uh, and uh, on, the, on those lines as well. So it looks like persistence and curiosity have really driven your journey. And what advice would you have for someone who would like to follow in your footsteps? What would be the best way to get a job or an internship at Novo Nordisk? Well, I mean, Novo Nordisk uh, these days have expand, are ex is expanding, especially the data science and digital science um, uh, teams across research, across you know development and stuff, and they keep on opening uh, you know internships, master internships, and posts uh, out in LinkedIn and different communication channels. So I would definitely you know advise people to look into it, follow the the Nordisk page and the jobs page in LinkedIn. Um, I would always definitely say everybody to network a lot, 
uh, it's very important uh, to network, be it at conference or, or in any shape or form. It's super important for people to do that. Um, I have, my journey has been not very smooth. There are people who, who can do things very fast as we're moving to the industry. These days, people def can def definitely move into data science after master's, depending on what, uh, what they want to pursue, or even after a PhD, it depends on which country one is doing it. Um, so, so, so I would just say, you know, network, uh, meet people, talk to them, and and uh, right, uh, find somebody like-minded who can actually be interested in in certain discussion, and you know, speak, ask, ask for it. Um, one thing I would always suggest is uh, one should be open to kind of uh, you know forget their learnings and you know learn new stuff. Uh, because as it's very important, I, I often I like this word. I don't remember from where I picked it up. It's called I like to say that you know learn to unlearn and relearn. So basically, it's okay to you know unlearn certain things and relearn because then because we always comes with certain biases and blind spots, and and we need to get rid of them and then only we can progress forward. So so if one is open to that and open to networking and uh, you know keeping an eye on what's out there. For different kinds of uh, internships that's out there from Novan Artisk or any other companies. There are plenty of opportunities uh, that comes out. Uh, so they should actually try out. And it's okay uh, to, you know, uh, reach out to people. Uh, not everybody might respond, but some will. Uh, because as much as they, uh, we need students and interns, uh, yeah. like they need internships as well, but we also need that, them as well. Yeah. So it's, it's a two-way street. Yeah. Thank you. And now I only have one last really important question to ask you. So what is it like living in Denmark? Oh, it's fantastic. It is a homecoming for me. Uh, so I, I did my PhD in Europe and then uh, I moved to US for a while and then came back to, to Denmark and Copenhagen. It's, it's a very lively, vibrant city. Um, I had no idea how Denmark was before I moved here. I just briefly came for work, uh, work meetings and stuff. Uh, it's an interesting in terms of the climate because you have three months of entire darkness here, like a huge, <laughs> yeah. And then, and then you have a very long extensive summers. Um, and this is my second, kind of getting into my second summer. Uh, people are, uh, you know, very lively. I mean, in summers, people become very lively and you have a lot, uh, you know, uh, I mean, Europe, in the European context, it's, uh, I'm having a great time. Um, and the important part is I work in an international team. So, you know, that, that also helps a lot because you, you get to, you know, there's an ensemble of culture, different culture, diverse culture. Diversity is pretty big in Copenhagen, to be honest. Uh, and, and that helps a lot to kind of when you're settling in as well. So, in, so far I have been having a great time. Uh, it's been near about two years, but it's been moving great, both in professional and personal side. That sounds great, Vivek. Thank you so much. I've learned so many flip side of the coin um, terms from you, challenge, be challenged, learn, unlearn, be ready to relearn. So all of these things, I'm sure that our audience will also take away from this um, episode. And thank you for sharing your journey. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I hope uh, every, every, everybody will take up something from this interview and all the best for the rest of you as well. Thank you.